770 CHQR. Uh, Rob Breckenridge in tomorrow morning and filling in this afternoon. I'm Shane Hewitt. Zach's here on the sitting here on the radio. And yes, the nickname I just throw it out there because some of that's how some of you know me. And you'll notice that some people call both. Uh, it is what it is. I don't care what you call me. So here's a uh, here's a conversation that I find extremely compelling, and it's inspired by a year and a half ago talking about it. I do love to hear the perspective of flat earthers. Maybe I'll get my mind changed today. Maybe I won't. The coolest thing about Flat Earthers is the look at, well, why? Why do you believe that? And that's really remarkable. And terrible story this weekend, though. Mad Mike uh, died over the weekend. Uh, Mike Hughes was his name. And there are a couple of stories that have been collapsed one on top of another here. So Mad Mike was a very open Flat Earther in his belief system. And it also happens that he's known to be a bit of a daredevil and liked rockets. So he was filming a show, according to Space.com, for homemade astronauts. It was a Science Channel show. And so he was on private land down in California, and they were trying to fly to 5,000 feet. The previous height that he had ever been to was about 1,800-ish feet, and, uh, and that, that was the rocket. So witnesses at the scene said that the rocket appeared to rub against the launch apparatus which might have caused the problems with parachutes. The rocket didn't get up very high, uh, turned around and crashed into the ground. Unfortunately, it was on February 22nd where Mad Mike passed away in that crash. Now, because Mad Mike is a flat earther, of course, the flat earther, what's he doing on a rocket? Well, he's trying to take pictures. He's trying to prove the earth was flat. According to the story so far, uh, that's just not the case. But it does beg the question, what's the, what's the big deal? Mark Sargent uh, is uh, from the States, and not only that, he's uh, had some documentaries that have been published all over the place. Behind the Curve, that was yours, right, Mark? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we didn't make it, but yeah, I was in it. I was the, the lead, pro- it, yeah. the, the protagonist, how's that? Yeah, the protagonist of, of all the things uh, behind the curve of the earth. So yeah. now Mark is in it, and that, that was on Netflix. I don't know if it still is now, but I'm sure you can find it if you go looking for it. Welcome to the program. Thanks for the time today, Mark. Oh, no, thank you very much for having me. So... You are a uh, flat earther. The earth is not round. That's how you see it, right? Right. And we don't even use the word round because round could be like, you know, a dinner plate. It's round your dining room table. Uh, It's not a ball, a sphere, a globe. How's that? Okay. All right. But that's that is very clear. Actually, I kind of threw out the uh, it's not a pizza. (laughs) So um, but how do we so how do we do this? Where does a flat earther uh, get this notion that that the earth is is not round they, it's not a sphere they initially get it because they try to disprove it nobody i i was one of the most stubborn people of all which is everybody goes into the theory hating it it's like oh flat earth is terrible it's ridiculous it's silly no one would ever believe in it and so you you try to tear it down yourself and in the process it's like okay well how can i prove the globe and it turns into this weird court case in your mind whereas can you prove the globe in a court of law and slowly but surely you, you you can't and what what happens is people come to me and they say well can you prove the flat earth right now can you prove it without without doubt I go, no no i can't but i can create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place you have left to turn is some sort of flat earth model and that's how it starts for everybody everybody tears down the globe themselves i don't have to convince you you end up convincing yourself which is why our retention rate is so high Okay, so convince me, Mark. Help me understand why this this world that I'm not going to sail off the edge of, sure, and how it possibly operates without me um, without me falling off the side. Got it. Got it. Okay. Why why you don't fall off the side? And I know everyone likes seeing that asteroid, you know, that flat asteroid in space image. We're saying no. It's it's way worse than that you're you're not living in a tiny little rock that's flying through space at impossible speeds in, in the impossible universe. You are living in a building. Basically, a, a, a planetarium, a terrarium, a sound stage uh, with walls and a floor and a ceiling. And that's why the water doesn't go anywhere, because you're literally in a structure. You're basically in a giant saltwater lake. What's outside it, we don't know. Um, do you want me to give you my, my, five, my top five bullet points of why it isn't a globe? That sort of thing? 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm cu- I mean, I'm curious. I think that we don't have this conversation unless we do it with an open mind and say, okay, show sure. me what you got. Sure, let's do it. Uh, first one, first and foremost, would be long-distance photography. Ten years ago, you could have told me, it's like, oh, yeah, boats go over the horizon. They go off into the distance. They look like they're going hull first. I'd say, okay, yeah, maybe that's maybe that's it. But then HD technology came in, and we've got cameras now like the Nikon P1000, you know, with amazing 150, 180-pound or power zoom, which all of a sudden the boats are not gone anymore. You can bring them back into frame over and over and over again, and you're just like, well, what's the point? My point is, if the curvature of the Earth is eight inches per mile squared, sooner or later you can't. There should be an object that you can't see because it's over behind the curve. It's gone forever. Uh, number two would be the um, gravity versus the vacuum of space. And that is, I don't know where you are right now, but it's, let's say you take the second floor of your building or whoever's listening, the second floor of wherever you are, turn it into a vacuum. That's where I am. Per- <laughs> Perfect. So let's, let's say that the second floor is a vacuum chamber and you have a cork in the ceiling, you pull it. What's going to happen? It's going to be instant. It's going to be violent. It's not like the movies right. where it's like, oh, we have two minutes of air left. It's, it's letting gonna... go of a balloon and zips around the room. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. You blow a balloon. It's going to a million out of a million times. It's going to do this. And then I say, well, why didn't gravity hold the air in your room right now instead of going upstairs? And you say, what's your point? My point is, well, when you go outside, why is the atmosphere still here? Because there's a massive, massive, massive vacuum chamber above us, supposedly, and yet the gravity that said that that couldn't hold the air in your room can hold everything here. Same gravity, same exact gravity. Uh, third would be the eclipse shadow. Eclipse shadow is too small. Uh, the moon is supposedly 2,000 miles wide, but the blackout zone, I don't know if you guys get the, the eclipses up in, in Canada the same way we do. But the blackout zone is only about 70 miles wide, which is like a 97% decrease. How is that even possible? And you say, well, there's, you know, special lensing of, of, the, of the shadow. It's like, oh, okay, well, what happens when the Earth is in front of the sun? Why don't we see that blackout zone, which would be four times as big on the moon? We never, ever see it. Fifth one would be the moon temperature, which I didn't even believe for the first six months that I looked at it, which was the moon is generating a cold light, meaning it cools things down. It's not that it's cold at night. The moon actually cools things. So if it's 90 degrees, I'm not going to convert it to Celsius for you. If it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit <laughs> in, in the sun, it's 80 degrees in the shade. We all know that. But if it's 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's warmer in the moon shade, up to 13 degrees Fahrenheit. That's that's impossible. You can you can check those a point and click infrared thermometer. You can there's all sorts of different tests. And we've done them. I've done them myself. It's it's impossible. Does that prove a flat Earth? No, but it absolutely destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon. Last one, fifth, last but not least, which is the Van Allen radiation belt trap question, which is a simple question, yes or no. Are the Van Allen radiation belts announced in 1959 by NASA are they deadly? Yes or no. If you say, yes, they are deadly, well, then how did the Americans get through them multiple round trips in the 60s without any shielding whatsoever? You got to remember, the only thing that stops radiation is gold, lead, and a whole bunch of water. They didn't use any of those. They used aluminum and plastic. Nobody made round trips. Nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Nobody even got cancer. Uh, There's still five of these guys walking around today. They all died from natural causes, the ones that died. And if you say, well, okay, well, they're not very deadly. It's like, well, okay, then you go to the nasa.gov website and they made a video at the end of 2014 that says, oh yeah, we, we can't even test capsules right now with humans because we can't solve the Van Allen radiation problem. It's like, what are you talking about? We So I posed those five questions to a, a astrophysicist okay. out of Georgetown and that was it. He folded like a card table and I said, we're not doing this. And that was it. All right. It. So I have questions then, Mark. Yeah, shoot. And, uh, and I'm going to, there's two of them, a couple in particular here, because there's a lot there. So of course. number one, so when I walk into, and I'm, <laughs> this is going to be hopefully ground level easy. Yeah. When I walk into Costco yeah. and uh, they have heaters, I don't know if they do down in the States where you are, but they have those parabolic heaters that are a dish and the heaters in the middle and it reflects the heat directly in one direction sure. is it not possible that the moon uh, reflects heat that's just a question you don't have to answer yes or no but the, it is possible and the the belt question yeah it seems like a completely unrelated topic only because it, it, the question of did we actually go to the moon is a whole different conversation of conspiracies it, in itself. Well, it, so it is possible just because we the belt is there and we didn't go through it doesn't mean the earth isn't a sphere no you're right but everybody seems to the reason why i bring that up is because everybody seems to lean on nasa and that's when i have to and when they when they do i immediately have to throw ah. it i i immediately have to throw it out and say you you can't use nasa and they say why not and i or any space agency i go because nasa didn't invent the solar system you know it's not like we invented you know this this whole thing in 1972 we've known that's that that leads to a whole bigger question it's which is 
we've known for at least five centuries that the Earth was a globe and, you know, the solar system model is like, how did you know? If, if NASA wasn't even founded until 1958, how did George Orwell ask this question? It was a great question, which was how did everybody know in, in the 40s all the way up into the mid 50s, how did everybody know that it was a globe? It wasn't that you knew, is that you were told and you were told right. so many and generations that we just took it for granted. So we are told many things in life, and that's a very, very good point. We're going to take a break, Mark. I'll be right back. I've sure. got more questions for you. And, okay. Uh, the, the pause there is that you believe it because you were told it to be so. That's the fun part for me. We'll get back with more, uh, including the conversation about NASA saying, well, we lost the technology to go to the moon. Oh, flat earthers. Is it all uh, crazy or not? We'll get more next. 770 CHQR. 403-974-8255-974-TALK. We've got Flat Earther Mark here on the phone. Thanks for sharing the time today, Mark. The text messages are coming in, and I'm, I'm just going to ask you, okay? Because yep. they're, they're coming in. Sure. Uh, so what happens if you sail a boat to the edge? You're implying that it's a, a, there's a, a, a roof or a ceiling. Wouldn't you just go bump and get to the well, edge? Well, the, the beginning of the edge is the Antarctic coastline, and Antarctica in this case would look vastly different from any other continent. Uh, Antarctica, instead of being like an island-type continent like Australia, would be stretched around the outside but it would be much much bigger so when you get to the antarctic coastline you would still have to go thousands of miles inland but yes eventually you would go bump into whatever the edge is be it i don't know, take your pick uh, heavy element heavy water force field whatever it is it's just part of a giant snow globe yeah okay snow globe hmm. so here is um and in canada that could be a canada joke i don't know um so the faraday cage is a real thing the apollo capsule had it uh allen radio uh the van allen radiation belt is an exposure thing is it not possible they just zip right through it uh not at the speeds they were going i mean if if the best speeds they can do are anywhere between 18 to twenty thousand miles an hour and they say that the Van Allen belts are donut shaped and pushing about 60,000 miles thick. You're talking about, because that's that was the question they asked Van Allen, which is, well, we're going to go really, really fast. It's like, well, now that's at least three hours each way. And remember, when you're coming back, you're in a capsule that's very, very limited and you're hitting the brakes. So you're even longer than the Van Allen belts on the way back. So no, I'm sorry. There, no one's ever been able to come to me. It's like, what shielding did they use? You need shielding against radiation. You think uh, it's a joke going to the dentist's office. Asked to get an x-ray taken without the lead blanket. Never going to happen. Okay, GPS. is Now, you said that sort of the dome snow globe idea. Is yeah. GPS just fixed in the snow globe? Yeah. Uh, GPS, unfortunately, is one of those necessary evils created by the United States military. It, the GPS is a military system we created back in the mid-90s. But it and it should have blanket coverage. Remember, it's like thirty plus satellites with overlapping blanket coverage. And yet, when you go into the southern oceans or anywhere offshore where there's no island between your plane and anything, uh, when you get about one hundred fifty miles away from shore, you blink off. Your latitude and longitude disappear, and you go into estimated mode, which means they don't know where you are. Look, take a look at the Malaysian flights and wonder why we lost a, a flagship. You know, one of our triple sevens out there. No one's done. No black box still gone. Tell me how. All right. Okay. So then um, the U.S. government has sort of said, like, let's go back to the moon. And then there's been this stuff floating around the Internet saying, well, we kind of lost the technology to go to the moon. Right. Uh, does a flat earther really believe that that's what we did? Oh, absolutely. Did I, I, I could send you so many photos. I mean, you, you just find any decent photo of a, any of the Apollo missions, and it's really, really horrible. Every president that we've had from Reagan all the way up until Trump, have they've all said the same thing. So I go, oh, we're going back. We're going back. We're going back. It's like. The last time any remember only one country supposedly ever went there was in 1972 was no one's ever questioning why we have no moon bases. No other country decided to go, especially in the Soviet Union. No one's ever gone. And the photos have aged horribly. Look at any photo. The shadows are going in multiple directions. There's no blast crater. The, the technology yep. couldn't possibly do 10 frames per second of video. I can give you a better argument than that. What? Chris Chris Rock said, "How is it possible we went to the moon? We can't even keep a bumper on a Cadillac." Damn so, straight. <laughs> that's that's a pretty good one. Okay, oh yeah, one it's, last question it's, because we got to wrap it up here, Mark. Is yeah. uh, the uh, plate tectonics? How is that a possibly a thing on the floor? If uh, this is not if this is not uh, uh, well, just just what you said. I mean, tiles on a floor works just as fine on a floor. I mean, we're talking about a, a mechanical structure here. We're talking about a building. So plates, you know, having the continents lay in a in the middle of a lake, you know, a saltwater lake and inside a building, pff, not hard at all. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I, uh, I, where can if people are truly interested, they want to learn more. Yeah. Um, where can they go to uh, to introduce themselves to you? Um, just go and just Google, type in Flat Earth Clues. Eventually, you'll find my channel. My channel is just my name, Mark Sargent, and Flat Earth Clues is a book. Or check out the documentary Behind the Curve. All right. Thanks so much for the time today, Mark. I appreciate it. I appreciate the uh, alternative perspective and looking at things. And that question is uh, what I'll explain to the audience next. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Mark. Mark Sargent.